school I teach in the legal ethics area, and it is both my pleasure and honor to introduce our distinguished lecturer, working team lecturer for this 2014, Laurel Terry. Uh, professor Terry is the Feldman Distinguished Professor at Penn State School of Law. And if you look at her CV, if you talk to people around the world, the experts that are in the room that work in this area, you will learn that Laurel truly is the leader in the field of lawyers and globalization, transnational practice. <coughs> you speak with people around the world, uh, look at what's being done in different jurisdictions, you'll see that they depend and rely heavily on what Professor Terry does. I mean, right now in province, uh, provinces in Canada, they are relying on her work in the area uh, that relates to regulatory objectives, part of what she's going to discuss today. Um, another example of how she has influenced what goes on around the world is that she was really the, the thought leader behind the establishment of an international body of regulators, and they continue to, to turn to uh, Laurel um, when it comes to determining what their agenda is on a go-forward basis. Um, and that's why I think she is the perfect speaker for us, because here at Costro we pride ourselves on impact and the way that we impact what's going on in the community and the legal profession, and Laurel truly is an impact player. So please join me in welcoming Professor Jimmy. Well, thank you very much. Um, I was very pleased to have been asked to deliver this lecture. Uh, first of all, because I follow in some very distinguished footsteps. And so it was an honor to be asked. Uh, but second of all, it was a real pleasure because Susan's a friend. And if you talk about impact, you have somebody right here on campus. Um, and so uh, I was really pleased to have been invited to do this. Um, so what I want to do today is tell you what regulatory objectives are, because you may not know. I'll talk a little bit about which jurisdictions have them, how they differ from each other, why I think it's a good idea to have them, and then how to actually do it if we want to implement this in the U.S., and then I'll give you a couple of examples of where I think having them would have been a good idea, maybe it might have changed the conversation a little bit. One of the nice things about being asked to deliver uh, this lecture is that um, I was told I could pick my topic. Um, and that's not an invitation that I get very often. And this is actually a paper that I had uh, written in 2012, uh, but I've never really given a talk on it. And I thought the paper should be getting more attention because I feel so passionately about this and care about it um, and wanted to get the word out. And to, to just tell you <coughs> why I think this is so important, I'm a firm believer that what gets measured matters. And I think just in education, we've probably all seen examples of this. In law schools, as U.S. news has changed its criteria, you see law schools changing what they do because they want to go up in the rankings. If you look at what's happening in uh, elementary education, secondary education, you look at all the testing that's going on uh, for No Child Left Behind, the international equivalent is the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development has a series of studies called PISA, and the U.S. isn't always happy with where we're ranked in this global ranking, and so we want a lot more STEM uh, concentration. And so I think these measurements really have a profound effect. And for students, just think about it. If your final exam were to write down the number of cases that started with the letter A, you would study very differently for that kind of test than for the test you take. So what people are measuring really does affect, I think, what goes on. So regulatory objectives uh, is sort of the trendy buzzword, but there are other words that are used to describe the equivalents. Uh, sometimes they show up 
um, in legislation with the title purposes. Sometimes they show up with the title objectives. Sometimes they show up with the title object or duty. But they're all talking about the same thing. They're talking about what is it that we are trying to achieve with these rules or legislation that are enacted. Because if you don't know what your goal is, how can you decide what to design and know whether or not uh, what you're designing is achieving is over-inclusive, under-inclusive, or just right? The term regulatory objectives uh, became popularized when the UK did a big study preliminary to changing their Legal Services Act in 2007. The report got a lot of play in the legal ethics community. It's known as the Clementi Report. And it talked about having uh, regulatory objectives. And then in the Legal Services Act, which is really quite a radical act, it has changed dramatically lawyer regulation um, in England and Wales. It's changed who regulates uh, solicitors and barristers. There's an oversight board that is required to have a non-lawyer chair and a non-lawyer majority. Um, it has changed the discipline system dramatically. It has introduced something that you may have heard of, alternative business structures. The acronym is ABS, which allows outside investment and ownership. Um, so it's this very dramatic act that's having a lot of spillover effect. Uh, particularly in New York, there's a lot of buzz about it because New York and London are the financial centers of the world. And so you have a lot of law firms that have offices in both cities <coughs> and therefore are influenced by this. My favorite part of the 2007 UK Legal Services Act is Section 1 because what they did for the first time is they established the re regulatory objectives. And they said, in our new system of regulation, this is what we are trying to accomplish. Um, and there was some uh, debate about this. Um, for example, the very first draft, amazingly enough, and actually a later draft as well, there we go, did not have the very first one of protecting or promoting public interest which is a pretty amazing thing to forget in your draft of objectives. Uh, it also didn't ha uh, talk about an independent legal profession. Um, but that's where this term regulatory objectives comes from, is really a lot of people are measuring it from the UK Act. Now, it's not just the UK. Um, there's a, a, a following the UK Act, because it didn't cover Scotland or Northern Ireland. Scotland came in with its own act. Um, Australia has a new act for a national legal profession that has this in it. There are draft laws pending in um, Ireland, quite a controversial one because initial draft took lawyers completely out of regulation. Um, and India, interestingly, <coughs> Canada has had these sorts of provisions for a long time in all of its provinces and, and territories. But they weren't really much subject to much vetting or debate. And so a number of Canadian provinces are now going back and re-examining them and deciding whether or not um, they're either under-inclusive or over-inclusive. For example, British Columbia had as one of their uh, objectives protecting the interests of the profession. And then they decided maybe that isn't actually what regulation should be trying to accomplish. So they amended it quite recently um, actually after our article, and uh, where we critiqued them, and took it out. Um, and Nova Scotia is involved in a really interesting regulatory project I'll tell you a little bit more about, but they're hoping to have uh, new regulatory objectives <coughs> by the spring. Um, so in what ways are these different regulatory objectives similar, and what ways are they different? Well, there are some themes that you tend to see coming out, you wouldn't be surprised, protection of the client, protection of the public. Although, interestingly enough, not in every single one. A lot of the Canadian uh, purpose statements, for example, don't refer to protection of the clients in there. Um, uh, but I would say those are probably the two most popular themes if you do a survey, which is what we've done. 
Uh, you do find a number of other themes also. Increasing access to justice. That was actually, um, has become one of the main drivers of a lot of the UK changes, is they have that provision in their regulatory objectives, and they're using that as one of the justifications for a number of the changes that they've made. Um, in the UK now, um, you can have outside investment in law firms. And so their equivalent of probably Walmart, um, the co-op, has a uh, very big uh, legal services division. Uh, one of the uh, large insurers has it. Hedge funds are buying in. I mean, it's really quite dramatically changed the legal services market in the UK. And one of the rationales for that is this access, whoops, that's not what I meant to do, is the access to justice. This promoting competition in legal services is worth pointing out. So there, a lot of the changes in the world have been driven by the <coughs> governmental antitrust authorities um, uh, directing scrutiny towards professional services, including legal services. And in a lot of countries, the antitrust departments are known as the competition authorities. And so um, as these countries have changed their lawyer regulation, uh, because a lot of the pressure is coming from the governmental antitrust departments, one of the things that they've had to f that uh, has uh, been embedded in a lot of these sets of regulatory objectives is this idea of increasing competition, uh, promoting the rule of law, ensuring lawyer competence. Those are all things that you see appearing in a number of these different themes. Um, now there are a few things that you find in uh, just a couple of countries. Um, so when we did our survey, uh, we found that in the Draft Ireland Bill, for example, and in the Scot Scottish Bill, they included in there as an objective having an independent, strong, diverse, and effective legal profession. Um, the draft, uh, the bill in Scotland also included this point about equal opportunities. Um, there are a number, uh, or a couple, that deal with the idea not just of what the content or result is, but what the process is. And so, for example, they focus on the regulatory process being timely, open, and efficient, or being efficient, effective, targeted, and proportional to who you're trying to reach. Um, What's interesting if you examine these is sometimes there's real differences in language. When the, because the UK, one of the drivers of their dramatic change uh, was the antitrust authorities, together with a very active consumer movement, they thought it was very important to not talk about clients. They thought it was really important to talk about consumers. Um, because we're trying to open up access, have different kinds of providers, what's with this lawyer protectionism stuff, and the word client just leads you down that road. Um, but not everybody does that. So you see some dramatic differences there. Um, uh, you see some uh, <coughs> differences in terms of how public protection is uh, described. Um, so... So there are differences, even if the concepts are the same. Now, why do I think that these are a good idea to have? Um, I don't see how you reach a goal or how you design a policy when you have a difficult issue unless you know what you're trying to achieve. Uh, it seems to me that's just really quite basic. You have to know where you're going to figure out how to get there. The other thing is that sometimes, I think, one of the criticisms of lawyer regulation has been that we're self-protectionists. And I think that <coughs> some of those charges sometimes are warranted, and sometimes they're not warranted. But it seems to me that without knowing what the ground rules are for what you're trying to achieve, it is probably inevitable, certainly understandable, if lawyer self-interest creeps in to the discussion and the decision-making policy. So part of what regulatory objectives can do is keep the inappropriate conversation out 
by saying, okay, so where is that? You know, increasing lawyers' market share, protecting lawyers. Where is that on our list of regulatory objectives that we're trying to achieve? Um, I think that it can be useful for regulators. In the U.S., we tend to have a tradition of responding after the fact rather than proactively uh, to lawyer conduct. We don't really try and fix it ahead of time or avoid it. And it seems to me if you have regulatory objectives, it might nudge the regulators as they implement the law to think about what they could be doing proactively as opposed to after a problem. <coughs> and finally, you know, maybe the lawyers are still, or whosoever the policymakers, are still going to be thinking in terms of protecting lawyers' turf. And maybe that's a secret motivation. But it seems to me there's a great value in changing the rhetoric that we use uh, when we are engaged in policy making and not using language that really we could not defend as an appropriate goal if we have our regulator hat on. So I see that as a great value. Now, um, there is a lot going on in the world with respect to lawyer regulation. Um, and when, uh, I keep saying we, so just so you know, I wrote this article about regulatory objectives with two regulators from Australia. Uh, so that's who the we is. Um, and our, our focus was to write this article on regulatory objectives. But we wanted to give a little bit of a setup and an introduction. And the introduction got so long that we ultimately had to spin it off into a separate standalone art article. And what we did in that prior introduction, now standalone article on trends in lawyer regulation, is we came up with this image of who, what, when, where, why, and how. Because at least when I was in grade school, we had to learn that in terms of all the questions. So I think it's something that for a lot of people, it's easy to remember. And there is so much going on right now with respect to all of these issues around the world with lawyer regulation. Who regulates? I've talked a little bit about in the UK, you had the government come in, displace the old regulators, substitute these new regulators who had limited lawyer involvement. Um, and that's a pattern that's happened in other countries as well. As I mentioned, this bill in, in Ireland is quite controversial because of taking the lawyers out almost entirely in the first draft. Um, but you have other international actors too. The World Trade Organization is involved in uh, uh, services regulation as well as goods, and that includes legal services. You have international organizations like, how many people have ever heard of the Financial Action Task Force? Yeah, that was me a couple of years ago. Incredibly powerful. Ends up, it's governmental. Most of the governments of the world directed towards uh, terrorism financing and money laundering. And they figure, well, the bad guys aren't going to change because we tell them to. So let's go after the gatekeepers. You know who those are, casinos, precious metal dealers, banks. Oh, yeah, lawyers, too. And they've lumped in lawyer regulation along with everything else and uh, have rules that basically are completely inconsistent with lawyer-client confidentiality. And, and if you don't comply, you get kicked out of the organization. And so right now, the U.S. legal profession is in this delicate dance with the U.S. Treasury Department so that the U.S. doesn't get kicked out of this anti-terrorism organization. And we're trying to avoid what's happened in the U.K., where U.K. solicitors filed like 5,000 reports annually on their clients because of suspicious behavior. You have to stop working on your client's matter. You can't say why you stopped working, so your client just thinks you're a procrastinator. And then most of these, you know, overwhelming number get cleared by the government. But meanwhile, you've told on your client, and you had to stop working. And that's the way they're implementing this spat of stuff. So in the U.S., we're trying to come up with a different path. Um, so, so that's the who regulates, what's regulated. You know, it used to be if you wanted to legal services, you went to a lawyer. You went to a lawyer, got legal services. They overlap. Now you have all these other providers in the market, right? You've got LegalZoom, uh, all sorts of people. And so the question is, are they part of what gets regulated? Do you regulate things or do you regulate people? Um, where to regulate? Lawyers operate virtually. 
but regulation is geographic. They don't match, and we haven't figured out how to deal with it. Uh, when regulation occurs, um, this Australian uh, proactive approach reduced client complaints by two-thirds. That's gotten a lot of people noticing uh, that timing might matter. Um, why is this topic <coughs> how there's a, a movement in a number of countries to go to something called um, uh, more principles-based as opposed to rules-based, outcome-focused regulation? But, but the point is there are all these issues coming down the pike, which are pretty dramatic, and we're going to be having to deal with them in the U.S. sooner or later. Ideas travel around the world. People talk to each other. And the regulatory objectives, I think, could help policymakers tackle these very, very challenging, complex issues. Um, so, two examples from outside the U.S. Um, in Nova Scotia, which, as you might imagine, is a very small jurisdiction, they are doing an incredibly exciting project where they are saying, okay, we're wiping the slate clean. We get to start from scratch. What would ideal lawyer regulation look like? And they are trying to build it from the ground up. It's really, really interesting uh, what they're doing. And so they, uh, they did a big study. They looked at what people around the world are doing. And then they had a meeting in October where they were able to agree to go forward. And so within two and a half years, they're going to try and do all this. Uh, big focus on access to legal services, because they, like a number of jurisdictions, have this incredible pro se population in the court uh, that is not able to afford a lawyer. But what are they doing to start? They're trying to come up with their regulatory objectives. They're hoping to have that by this spring so that they can go, then go forward as they build the new system. In uh, the Law Society of Upper Canada, which is the name of the regulator for Ontario, which is the largest jurisdiction in Canada and where most of their lawyers are based, biggest uh, lawyer concentration in Toronto, um, they're really upset about this access to legal services issue. And so they've been bringing together first the thought leaders. Um, I spoke at that group in October. Susan spoke to their policy makers uh, just last month. And... Um, you know, they're trying to say, are we tackling uh, this problem of uh, underserved populations in the best possible way, and are, might there be other alternatives out there? And as part of their analysis, they're trying to think about what their regulatory objectives are. But I think it's not just over there that these could be useful. I think this could be really useful in the U.S. as well. And I'm going to give you three examples of where I think regulatory uh, objectives shows you how it could shape the conversation. Um, so the first is a case you may all know from New York here, um, Alexander versus Cahill, and um, a lawyer advertising case. And I'm going to read you a little bit of language because I think it's so powerful from the district court opinion, uh, from footnote four. So here's the, the court. At the first oral argument, the court instructed the parties to apply the test in Central Hudson to the challenged amendments. However, despite the court's directive, defendants continue to assert that the state of New York could ban attorney advertising that was irrelevant, unverifiable, and non-informational without reference to Central Hudson. Defendants have provided no legal support for this proposition, and the court finds none. Boy, I would not have wanted to be on the receiving end of that footnote. Um, Central Hudson, uh, as many of you know, is the Supreme Court's test for evaluating First Amendment <coughs> challenges and restrictions on lawyer speech. So what that case tells me is that the court really nice to know what the standards are, First Amendment at Central Hudson, and they expect lawyers to frame their argument according to what the standards are, what the objectives are. Now, we have them for First Amendment lawyer advertising, even though they weren't always using it for the whole part. By the second circuit, they, had, they were framing their arguments appropriately. Um, but we don't really have them outside of this First Amendment lawyer advertising context. And I think we need something equivalent to Central Hudson 
for all the other issues of lawyer regulation that the courts and the policymakers would be using when they're deciding what to do with these very difficult, complex issues. Um, the same way that the court wanted, had a benchmark and wanted it to be used for lawyer advertising, we should develop those same uh, objectives and benchmarks, if you will, for other kinds of lawyer regulation. So that's my first example. Uh, my second example is down here in the lower right. So um, you may or may not know that there is a law school in China, uh, the Peking University School of Transnational Law, <coughs> very small, um, whose students are the cream of the crop in China, very, very smart, apparently, um, who, many of whom have a under, uh, Chinese law degree, um, who are taking their classes in English uh, using U.S. case books. Uh, many other professors are, you know, Harvard, Yale professors flown in for a special stint, uh, along with uh, U.S. law school style professors, many of whom are from the U.S. Um, and the Peking University School of Transnational Law told the ABA that it wanted to be ABA accredited and that it was planning on applying. And if it were an ABA accredited law school, then its 60 or so graduates would be able to sit for a bar exam. And so the um, ABA section of legal education and admissions to the bar referred this issue to a committee, which did a report, and then it was circulated to the public for notice and comment. Totally appropriate. The responses that the ABA section of legal education got are posted on its website. And, you know, they're eye-opening, I think. There are a lot of very thoughtful responses both ways, yes and no. But there are some responses in there that, in my view, were just completely inappropriate um, and completely xenophobic. And I think that part of the problem in the quality of the comments that were received were that there's no regulatory objectives. There's nothing to say what our ground rules are for regulating lawyers and for regulating legal education. Now, if we had had regulatory objectives, hopefully it would have been like Alexander V. Cahill, hopefully people would have paid attention, and they would have framed their yes or no answers in terms of what it is that we are trying to achieve. Now, they may have had the same uh, um, secret motivations and thoughts as they expressed. A lot of these were sort of one sentence emails, so they were not particularly well thought out. Um, but again, I think rhetoric matters. I think it matters how we talk about issues. And I think if you had had regulatory objectives, um, you would have had a, a deeper, more complex, more thoughtful discussion than showed up in some of these comments that were submitted. So the third example is from this fall. Um, Fordham held a symposium on uh, the legal profession's monopoly on the practice of law. Um, and they, um, uh, I was invited to participate and the papers of a number of people were circulated ahead of time. And so I read 12 papers before I went to the conference. In seven of these papers, the author said something with respect to the goal of lawyer regulation where I thought it would be really helpful for the author to know about the UK regulatory objectives <coughs> and our recommendations for what's in there. And it just, it would have made the discussion better to have some sense of a shared understanding of what, the, what we're trying to achieve. Um, and interestingly enough, in these seven papers, everybody's talking about the goals of lawyer regulation in their paper, but they didn't match up. Um, everybody's got a slightly different take on it. And I think there would be a real value 
to us as a society, having the same conversation that has happened in other jurisdictions around the world, where at the outset we have a conversation about what we're trying to achieve. <coughs> and then, <coughs> when you have these papers on very diverse topics within the frame of competition, <coughs> um, you know, everybody's got the same frame of reference about what we're trying to achieve. Um, here at Hofstra, you had a symposium that I was very sorry to miss, but I was on sabbatical uh, last year on ethical infrastructure. Seems to be the same thing. <coughs> the papers from that symposium were terrific, but I think they would have had even more force if you could look and say, as a community, as a society, We've agreed on these regulatory objectives, and we think this particular approach furthers objective X, Y, and Z for these reasons. I think it just makes the discussion better. Um, so what do I recommend for where we go from here? Uh, well, the first thing is you've got to uh, come up with a process. Um, and you're going to want buy-in, I think, for these regulatory objectives. And so that means that you need very broad stakeholder participation. And, um, you know, it's easy for lawyers to form committees of just lawyers, because that's who our friends are and who we know. And I think you need to really reach much broader, because after all, lawyer regulation doesn't only affect lawyers. It affects the society at large, clients, the public. So I think you want broad stakeholder participation. Um, you know, there's a big debate going on around the world about who should regulate lawyers. Um, but we are, and in fact, there's a ton of people that regulate lawyers in the U.S. But we have our traditional source of regulation is the highest court in each state. Although I know New York has its own idiosyncrasies in terms of uh, individual ethics rules uh, coming from the departments. But... Um, uh, so I think you, for credibility, you want this committee to be created by the highest court in the state so that you're not getting any pushback with the legislature doing it the way they've done in some countries. Um, I would make sure that whatever you come up with gets circulated for public comment. I recently concluded uh, uh, serving on a, I have a great name of the ad hoc committee uh, in Pennsylvania which was uh, supposed to come up with a new code of judicial conduct. And it was appointed by the Chief Justice. It was chaired by one of the judges of the Superior Court, our intermediate appellate court. Um, and actually, to my shock and chagrin, the drafts that we produced were not circulated. Um, and, you know, I was quite taken aback. There was uh, only three academics on this committee. And I'm used to operating in the environment of the ABA Center for Professional Responsibility, which does lots of drafts and a lot of work on circulating them, you know, lots of opportunity for comment, and I think that's really great. And I think the experience here shows how important that is. Because, again, remember, 2007 UK Legal Services Act, they forgot public interest. And they forgot it both in the initial draft uh, from the staff in the Department of Constitutional Affairs, but then they forgot it in Parliament and uh, House of Lords, too. So I think having lots of eyes on things is a really good thing. And, you know, again, it's not just over there, we've done it here, too. Uh, many in this room, not everyone, certainly a lot of you won't, but many in this room will remember the ABA debates about multidisciplinary practice. Um, and one of the big themes in the whole MVP debates was core values. Well, draft one of core values did not say that lawyer competence in doing a good job for your client was a core value. Uh, it was all sort of lawyer focused, not client focused. Now, they fixed it in draft two, but again, I just think it shows you why lots of eyes on things in circulating public drafts is a good idea. Um, now, so create a committee, and what does the committee do? Well, this law review article, we came up with our list of the starting template um, of what we would put on draft one. We're not saying this should be your final version. We think that everybody <coughs> needs ownership and needs buy-in. 
Um, but this is um, this is where we would have started. Now, um, what's controversial in our version of it? Well, we picked the word clients, not the word consumers, because we think that the lawyer-client relationship is different than a lot of relationships out there. There are fiduciary obligations, there are special responsibilities, and we think it's important to use language to signal that. But, you know, not everybody may agree. They may think it's important to try and get away from a mentality (coughs) in which maybe might lend itself more to lawyer self-protectionism and lawyer paternalism, and so maybe you want to use the word consumer. But that's one of the issues. Um, We did not um, put as a separate um, uh, objective promoting competition. Um, And that's a pretty big difference. As I mentioned, you have all these antitrust authorities from around the world that have looked at the legal profession. Um, But it seemed to us when we were talking about it, well, why do you have antitrust laws? Why do you have competition (coughs) laws? And really, it's an instrumental goal, not an end in itself. It seems to me that you have antitrust laws to promote access. And so rather than making this a standalone end in itself, we incorporated it in our increasing access to justice. We think part of what that may mean is thinking about uh, you know, how you get competition and appropriate competition in the legal services <coughs> sector market. Um, so lawyer independence. Uh, When there are debates, as there were, for example, fairly recently in the context of the ABA Commission on Ethics 2020, about, um, uh, there the issue was about this alternative business structures, ABS, that is going on in England and Wales and elsewhere in the world. Often the argument ends up being, good idea, can't do it for values. I mean, it just sometimes doesn't get much deeper than just citing core values, one of which is lawyer independence. And then the other side says, oh, you're being completely self-protectionist. Independence is just a cover for you know, protecting your turf. <coughs> I don't believe that's true. I believe that lawyer independence is a very, very important uh, concept. Um, but I think that it probably has, on some occasions, been used uh, to justify self-protective behavior on the part of lawyers. So we again looked at this and said, <clears throat> lawyer independence is not an end in itself. It's an instrumental value <coughs> Excuse me, that we value because we value the rule of law. And we want a robust rule of law culture in which lawyers will push back against the government, push back against the powerful. And so that's the value that it's serving. (coughs) So partly to avoid some of the critiques when lawyer independence is included, we put it, we embedded it in our concept of the rule of law. Um, So what else? We uh, liked this idea where you talk not just about the result, but you talk about the process of how you get there. We think that that's really useful to remind people. Um, So we put in there ensuring uh, that lawyer regulation is consistent with principles of good regulation. Now, I was at a conference two weeks ago um, at the Conference of Chiefs Justices and I could not have been more pleased because Chief Justice Emeritus of Utah, um, who was on the ABA Task Force on the Future of Legal Education, was in the midst of talking about the task force report, and she waves sort of the short version of this regulatory objectives article, which came out in December in the Professional Lawyer magazine, 
Uh, and I know her, but I don't, I don't think it registered that, to her that I had written it because I'm sitting in the audience and she says, there's this really interesting article that came out that you should read saying maybe we should think about what we're doing. And she read off the list. And then she got to the good regulations. She said, well, whatever that means, it must be a term of art beyond me. So maybe this is a little too cryptic <laughs> the way we put it in our list. But it's the idea that you have timely effective, efficient regulation. I think that concept about the process is a good one. Um, the one that I sort of every now and think, oh, did we make the right decision, is we excluded an explicit diversity objective. You may remember that in uh, the Scottish and the draft Irish bill, for example, one of them said equal opportunity, one of them said diverse independent. And once again on this one, we were trying to keep things um, as focused as we could. And we decided, well, really, why do we want equal opportunity? And why do we want diversity in the legal profession? And I think a lot of the reasons why we want it is for the access to justice issues and for the rule of law reasons. That is, it's an instrumental value so that everybody in the society can get access to legal services, and so that everybody has respect for and belief in the integrity and credibility of the system. Um, but, I, but I wonder sometimes whether or not that was a good choice to leave it off the list. Um, but it's food for discussion in this committee. Um, so this is just the compare and contrast ours in the UK one. So I'll conclude just by saying, I think this is really important. Um, and I was so pleased to be asked and to be given an opportunity to talk about this. <coughs> I don't think adopting regulatory objectives is going to be easy. I think you're going to have a lot of knockdown, drag out fights about what should be in and what should be out. But it seems to me that's really good for society to have. It's good to talk about what our goals are and what we're trying to achieve, and what's appropriate, and what's not appropriate. And you know, not everybody may be happy with the final result, but it seems to me that's how a rule of law society works. You know, you sort of debate it out, and then you, you know, you got a law uh, uh, set. I think that it would make, there's a lot of really hard lawyer regulation issues coming down the pike. And I think having these would make our discussions uh, much uh, more nuanced and thoughtful. It's not going to answer any questions. One of the fights that some of these jurisdictions have had is, should we set priorities? And they've all decided against that, which I think is the right choice. But some of these objectives in any given context are going to be conflicting. So it's not going to answer the question. But at least it makes you think about all of the issues, hopefully. And it makes you, gives you um, guidance as to what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, like protecting lawyers' turf. Um, so I think it's a great idea. I hope some of you have connections out there with some of the thought leaders and implementers. And so I'll just conclude by saying, let's have another committee. <laughs> so, and I'd be happy to take questions. and very illuminating. Thank you very much. Um, I had two, two observations. And the first is that I suppose that all of this legislative act, this would be legislative ultimately. These, these well, I think in the U.S. it could be court rules. Um, well, in, in, in the case in which it is legislative, it, it, in, in a lot of consumer legislation and, and legislation generally, there's always a predicate before you have the purposes yes. clause. And I would strongly suggest that uh, that you incorporate the idea of a factual predicate prior to the, to the actual statement of purposes. And give me an example of what kind of factual predicate, because I think one thing you want to do is not have it frozen in time, where the facts you rely on become stale, you know, 10, 20 years down the road. Well, I, I mean, in, in fraud and in misrepresentation law generally, whenever Congress passes a piece of legislation, um, they find, Congress yeah. finds that people rely on odometers 
for example, or people who use it. Yeah. And those are very important subsequently in actually enforcing the legislation. Yeah, I think that's right. And I would hope for really general lawyers are important. You know, the public needs lawyers, big unmet legal need, things like that, yeah. The second point is that um, I, if, if, I would strongly question whether um, the word uh, client substitutes for the word consumer. I think that's a false, that's a, that's a false assumption. I think um, just as in medicine, it isn't the case that we have uniformly always replaced the word patient with the word consumer. So um, would you we, have both or would yes, you use... Yes, we have, you know, I think it would be much more appropriate to think about uh, adding both of those terms rather than subtracting the word consumer. Uh -huh. because, because with respect to a client, you have fiduciary duties. Um, and, and that client relationship is focused on the actual fiduciary duties involved in representation. The consumer aspect of it, it seems to me, is concerned with the uh, commercial marketplace um, aspects of this relationship, which is, uh, strikes me out of the uh, regulation in, in a way which is distinct frequently from the client relationship. Yeah. This is why I think a committee would be really fun to be on. <laughs> you would have these really interesting discussions about you know, who you're trying to affect and how, and whether or not the consumers are, you know, fall within public interest or access, or maybe it's a separate group. I mean, I don't think it's a, you know, you get the list and you rubber stamp it. I think there are really important issues here. Yeah. Uh, I think your proposal is absolutely terrific. And my question goes to the specifics in the U.S. context. So you suggest uh, regulatory objectives for the legal profession, yeah. not for the delivery of legal services. Oh, well, that's another good point for the, the committee. And, and one of the questions that raised for me was this. Right? We're living in a world where the fastest growing market for legal services in the United States is wholly unregulated, right? Where legal Zoom is, you know, accounts for 20% of the corporations in California, right? So if we still keep our focus, regulatory focus on the legal profession, then sort of are we missing, and what do you think of extending yeah. your proposal? Um, I wouldn't do it from the outset, because what you are talking about is incredibly controversial. Um, I think it's an issue that we're going to end up having to face in the U.S. because it's happening around the world. It's the issue that in Nova Scotia and in uh, the Law Society of Upper Canada, they're trying to figure out whether the great unmet need, the 80% pro se clients in court, mean we need to think about regulated alternatives and inviting them into the market. But I think if you said that at the outset, your committee would totally disband and dissolve. So uh, maybe uh, you started off as regulation of you know, what are the regulatory objectives when we regulate lawyers? Get that list. After you have that list, say, okay, now should we be regulating others? In uh, Upper Canada, they decided, hey, a lot of legal services are being delivered by paralegals and appropriately should be delivered by paralegals. So if you um, look at this little slide here, You'll notice it says, for the public, for lawyers, for paralegals. And they've been doing it for five years, and they just had their five-year report last year. That both the Law Society and <coughs> the government, they had two separate independent commission reports. And the bottom line was, hey, this is working pretty good. Um, and so now they're thinking, in Nova Scotia, for example, that maybe we need to do what the UK does, outside investment, because we can't solve the access issues on a retail, one-on-one -on -one basis. We need to leverage technology. And technology requires money. We need to get um, you know, some of the money in the marketplace out there into the regulated sphere. Now, I don't know if that's ultimately the right answer or not. But I think it's a conversation we're going to end up having to have in this country. I think it would make sense to be talking about if we go that far out, what do we want the regulatory objectives for the legal services space to be? But I think if you try to start there, you totally implode the committee. Yeah. I, I great, very interesting. I can think of three sources that would enact these objectives uh -huh. in varying orders of lawyer, in, quote, traditional lawyer independence. Lawyers themselves, uh -huh. courts, 
which regulate lawyers as officers of the courts, and legislatures, since lawyers deliver consumer-type services, and off, which, which yeah. would you recommend? Because it looks like from the list that you're coming up with there, different places have different sources that yeah. promote the objectives. Yeah. And the article that we wrote, that was an introductory section talking about there's all different places where this could happen in all different forms in which it can take. Um, in the U.S., I would start in the courts for the same reason I wouldn't put make it legal services. I think if you tried to do it in either the federal or state legislatures, the whole project would implode because you would have all this lobbying going on by the ABA, which as recently as 2002 in the MJP Commission report said we reaffirm judicial state regulation of lawyers. So you'd, you'd have the Conference of Chief Justices and the ABA trying to derail the process in the legislatures. So why would start in the courts? Huh. Um, why not the leg? Yes, be, well, that's the path of least resistance. Where, where the maximum stakeholders come in the legislature. Now, well, they're elected. They have more, more broad-based representation. They have more, not not to be contentious, but they they represent a broader constituency than the courts. They do. Um, so one thing about my research is I much prefer to tell people, this is really important issue, go talk amongst yourselves, <laughs> than to give you that answer. <laughs> so I waffle a lot on things. But, um, you know, I'm a little nervous about having legislative uh, regulation of lawyers. Because, precisely because it's majoritarian. Um, it seems to me a lot of what we want is a rule of law culture, and in some ways that goes right against majoritarian. Um, and so I'm not sure that I'm comfortable turning over lawyer regulation to the legislature. Now, on the other hand, I do think the courts do a lot better job than the lawyer groups themselves. I've sat in a lot of bar meetings where I thought, boy, if the newspaper were here, I don't think you would want your last sentence publicized because they're really a totally protectionist. The courts are accused of being protectionist, but I have to say that has not been my experience hearing their rhetoric. Now, they're often very conservative because they are focused on a different class of clients and lawyering. They see the bottom of the market, not the top of the market. Um, um, but, but I'm not quite ready to go to legislative uh, regulation of lawyers, even though clearly if you look at what's out there, we already have a ton of it. I mean, this whole method of state judicial regulation of lawyers is just not really accurate for how lawyers are regulated. But a big, big piece of it comes from the courts. And, and they are very powerful. Um, and I think and I think they've been shirking their responsibilities a little bit, quite frankly, by deferring too much uh, to bar associations and lawyers. It hasn't been, I think, one of the highest issues on their priority list sometimes, because they're dealing with court funding and lots of other things that are bad. But, um, but I would try to make them engage. Um, Okay, one last, yeah. I was curious in that same vein, you talked about having public comment, basically, and yeah. wanting to avoid the pitfalls of self-preservation mm -hmm. of having only legal professionals do it, but then also having, wanting to avoid the whole one-sentence, unhelpful sort of commentary yeah. that right. other people do. And then you spoke about not wanting legislature to be involved, so I'm curious who you'd actually want to be involved in. I'd put everybody on the committee, including antitrust authorities, which I think would make the courts and uh, um, the lawyers very nervous to invite them to the table. I would invite the Chamber of Commerce. I would invite lots of client representatives. Um, and I would have a lot of discussion of what comes out. The, my comment about shaping the conversation is, is you're going to have a lot of knockdown, down drag-out fights, I think. And I'm willing to go with the majoritarian process within the committee then endorsed by the court. But once you've got a set, then I would be like the Alexander V. Kale district court saying, we got Central Hudson. What are you doing talking about these other things? Central Hudson is our test. And I would say, here's our regulatory objectives. We've got a tough new issue. Tell me how your proposed solution to the issue fits these regulatory objectives. And people are going to disagree, but at least they're framing their conversation in the values and goals that we've decided are important. That's a great note to end on. She came up with that.